Sunday service. This morning we're going to meditate few minutes. After that, Stephen Subodha is going to give a Dhamma talk. After the Dhamma talk, question and answer and the chanting. Right now, Ravan Chandasara is going to lead the Mitha meditation. Let us start with the breathing meditation. Just be aware of the inhalation and exhalation as they naturally occur. Let's be mindful on our breathe in and breathe out as they naturally occur. Now we shall spread loving kindness thoughts to all the living beings, including us. May all the living beings be physically well. May all the living beings be safe. May all the living beings be mentally well. Let's continue spreading loving kindness thoughts in this way until we hear the bell sound.
साधु 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 थैंक यू चंद्र सार लीडिंग द मेडिटेशन स्टीवन सुबोध इज गोइंग टू स्टार्ट द हिज टाइम टॉक आई शुड से समथिंग नेक्स्ट संडे द ट्वेंटी फर्स्ट इज अ बुलंबन सर्विस प्लीज कम एंड जॉइन विथ अस we have dan for the monks and the lunch for the lay people bring your friends relatives also and uh, it's a good one so i want to say uh, is it tom and vick they are right now sada yes yes come Yes, Radha. Please remember. Yes. Next Sunday. All right. Thank you. We'll be there. All we'll right. Thank you, Radha. Thank you, uh, Stephen. You can start your dumb talk uh, right now. Thank you, Bante. I pay homage to the Buddha. I pay homage to the Dhamma. I pay homage to the Sangha. Last month I was reminded of a a memory uh, you know something that I hadn't really thought about in a in a long time something happened about maybe uh 15 or so years ago Back then I used to go on a lot of uh hikes you know I was I was a big nature guy so I you know I would go on hiking trips with friends and there was one time that I was hiking with a a good friend of mine in the the Mount Baldy area um the part I think it's called the you know Ice House Canyon or something like that it's a nice long trail there's uh you know a, a river that runs through there and and so on and as my friend and I were were going up the, the trail we had managed to spot a adolescent sized rattlesnake and it was a pretty one and you know at the time i didn't know much about rattlesnakes so i couldn't tell you what kind you know whether it was like a pacific coastal or anything like that i couldn't tell you what kind it was we just knew that it was pretty young based on the size and we saw the the rattlesnake kind of hanging out in the rocks made note of it looked at it for a while admired it and then carried on we continued up the trail after we had spent some time uh further up the trail and and resting near the river my friend and i decided to start heading back down the trail and our on our way down we came across uh an older man and two women and they were picking rocks up off the ground on the trail and throwing them at the rattlesnake and they were probably a good 10 feet or so maybe more away from the rattlesnake which hadn't been bothering them in in any way but they had been startled by the sight of the rattlesnake and uh as far as i could tell were determined to either scare the rattlesnake off or uh trying to to kill it i don't know but it was a fairly young rattlesnake and they're picking up pretty good sized rocks and throwing them at the rattlesnake and even hitting the rattlesnake and we could see the rattlesnake reacting now the difficult part of the situation was approaching them and knowing exactly what to do you know do do we try to stop them do we try to say something and you know as, as far as i can remember i think my my friend and i you know she and i both tried to say something to these people but uh they didn't seem to speak the the same language as us or we didn't know any of the same languages to communicate with each other so we tried to communicate but we weren't really weren't communicating and they seemed to be confused by our anger and uh we seemed to be confused by them seeming to think they were doing us a favor by pointing like look snake and like yeah we know stop throwing rocks at it and so it was a very uh troubling experience my friend and i both walked down the trail and were disheartened at the the treatment of the rattlesnake 
And lately I've been thinking now about the difference between how my friend and I responded to seeing and spotting that rattlesnake out in nature and the response of these three people and why they were so different. And I think that it comes down to three qualities that I, I want to talk about today that are um, very related and overlapping. And so I want to try to talk about them distinctly, but there are going to be times where they they overlap so much, it's going to seem like I'm talking about, about the same quality. And this would be uh, the quality of, of kindness or, or goodwill, what we call metta. But alongside uh, kindness, alongside goodwill, we have other qualities like uh, skillfulness and uh, observance or uh, discernment or wisdom, we might call. And these three qualities are very interlinked in terms of how they affect our behavior, how we, we act in the world. I will say at the onset that when I talk about metta, I'm not talking about love. And that's a good thing because uh, I have no strong love and affection for snakes, despite the story I just told. <laughs> and that's not for lack of trying. You know, when I was very, very young, I was uh, very enamored with the idea of being around animals. When I was especially young, four or five years old, I had wanted to uh, own a zoo, not work at a zoo, own one. I don't know how I got that in my head. And so I wanted to be around animals all the time. And around that age, I had this safari hat that I would wear all the time wherever I went. And my mom thought it was so funny. There's so many pictures of me at that age, three, four, five years old, walking around everywhere wearing a safari hat. And then as I got older, growing up and watching all sorts of animal documentaries on PBS and so on, and seeing shows like, uh, you know, Steve Irwin's Crocodile Hunter and, you know, all, all, all sorts of things like that, I, I got it in my head that I, I wanted to be around animals a lot. And then as I got a little older towards middle school age, I was very gothy and liked the whole mystery of creepy things. And so I, I wanted to be the kind of guy that owned snakes. And I wasn't very creative. I think over the, the span of my childhood, I had maybe two or three uh, snakes, only one at a time. And I named, I think, every single one of them Seth. That's how lack of imagination I had in regard of naming them. And I started off with smaller snakes. My very first snake was a, like a very small garden snake. And then my second and third snake, uh, one was a ball python, the other one was a reticulated python. And uh, you'll notice that I didn't say any of them overlapped because partially I wasn't very good at owning pets at a young age and neither were my parents. Uh, but then also at a certain point they got big because I didn't know how big they got because I was a kid and we ended up having to give them away to people who could take care of them far better than I could. For example, if, if people don't know about the reticulated python, when I got it, it was a cute little baby. And then reticulated pythons, if allowed to, give enough space to grow, can become uh, one of the largest snakes in the world. Uh, so <laughs> not necessarily the, the best pet. But at the, at the time, I was trying my best to take care of these snakes. And the problem ended up being for me was sort of twofold. As I became older and practiced Buddhism more as I was entering into my teens, it became much more difficult for me to stomach feeding uh, my snakes. At the time, I didn't know that it was possible to, to buy um, already dead mice to feed the snakes, the kind you put in the freezer. So all I knew was to go to the, the nearby shop that specialized in, uh, in reptiles and buy live mice to feed the snakes. And after a while, that became very difficult to, to do, to see that, to throw the mice in there and see what, what nature does uh, when snakes and mice meet. The other issue that I came across was that I uh, was very afraid of being bitten by snakes, which doesn't lend itself very well to having snakes as pets. And it got to the point where when I would try to reach in and, and grab the snakes, I'd become so scared of, of being bitten to pick them up out of their terrariums that I would I would hesitate and that would make me shaky and the snake would respond in an odd way and then so eventually I got to the point where one of my tricks would be to put on some garden gloves like the thick 
kind of gloves to pick up the snake, then bring the snake over to the bed where I would sit down and then take my gloves off then, and then pet the snake and then put it back. But eventually even that uh, became too much. And I had for my final snake, my reticulated python, I, I eventually found a, a good home with someone who specialized in taking care of snakes and, and animals and iguanas and everything like that. So I felt pretty, pretty good about uh, where, where that snake ended up. So I say all of that, seeing that now I'm in such a position where I do have a lot of goodwill and a lot of kindness towards snakes, but not a lot of love. I would say that even now, uh, I wouldn't really want to put my hand near a snake for fear that I'd be bit. Uh, and yet that doesn't change the, the goodwill that, that I feel for them. Now, a lot of the time when we practice goodwill these days, we, we tend to recite uh, very similar passages, very similar chants. And when we do that, um, we can become very, I would say numb to uh, to the kind of words we're saying, you know, they, they don't necessarily resonate or or we think they were just they're just words. And, you know, it's it's important to remember that when we're spreading thoughts of, of goodwill, we're beginning uh, with ourselves and really trying to give rise to a, a really sincere wish, a, a strong, wholesome desire for our true happiness. You know, uh, what that means is that uh, a happiness that is not derived from greed or aversion or delusion, the kind of happiness that comes from the disillusion of defilements. And as I said, I wanna tie this idea of kindness or goodwill, metta, to other qualities like skillfulness and discernment or observance. And we can see this even in the suttas where that are on goodwill that involve the recitation of words. One example is in the Sutta Nipata of on goodwill, where the Buddha begins by saying, this is to be done by one skilled in aims, appreciating the state of peace, be capable, upright, and straightforward, easy to instruct, gentle and non, not conceited, he continues. And then the part that should be thought, the part that should be spread, happy, at rest, may all beings be happy at heart. Whatever beings there may be, weak or strong, without exception, long, large, middling, short, subtle, gross, seen and unseen, living near and far away, born or seeking birth, may all beings be happy at heart. Let no one deceive another or despise anyone anywhere, or through anger or resistance perception, wish for another to suffer. What I find powerful about the phrasing in this particular sutta on, on metta and the kind of thoughts that we give rise to when spreading metta around is how they're based not only in just wishing for people to be happy in a, in a general way, but happy in the way that, that really matters, a, a happiness that's derived from skillfulness, let no one deceive another or despise anyone anywhere or through anger or resistance perception wish for another to suffer. So when we're wishing for our own happiness and the happiness of others, when we're sending these thoughts of, of friendliness and kindness, they're based in wishing for people to have the means for true happiness and the ability to follow through on those means, to have the appropriate understanding of the causes of, of suffering and then finding the happiness that comes from letting go of those causes of suffering. And how beautiful to think in that way, to look at others and want them to truly be happy, to have the means for happiness. And it has to start from within and then it can be spread around. The Buddha continues, as a mother would risk her life to protect her child, her only child, even so should one cultivate the heart limitlessly with regard to all beings, with good will for the entire cosmos, cultivate the heart limitlessly, above, below, and all around, unobstructed without hostility or hate. And this is something that we can do in all modes of being, the Buddha says, whether standing, walking, sitting, or lying down, 
As long as one has banished torpor, one should be resolved on this mindfulness. And the Buddha continues, but virtuous and consummate in vision, having subdued greed for sensuality, one never again will lie in the womb. The idea being that metta as goodwill gives us the impetus to practice in a certain way, to live in a certain way, to live skillfully in a certain way. So as we move through metta, we have this goodwill for ourselves that inspires us to practice the path. And then in regard to others, we extend that desire too for them to not necessarily practice the way we practice, but to practice in such a way that they have a, a heart that's lightened, a heart that they too can uh, find that limitless quality with regard to all beings. And that requires living in a certain way, uh, not just having a belief or a thought, but taking that belief or thought or perception and turning it into action, which is why at the very beginning of the passage, the Buddha doesn't just only talk about having a view, but talks about virtue and talks about consummation and vision. One of the passages that we see in here is the idea of a mother uh, risking her life to protect her child. And it's a beautiful image that also ends up being applied to skillfulness. It's not the, quite the thing that we're familiar with. Oftentimes when we hear this passage, we only think about it in terms of metta as a thought, as a perception, as a, an intention for ourselves and others, that may others be happy. But we don't often think about what it means to put that into practice. And that practice we find in the term kusala, to be skillful. There's another passage that's in the Tedagatha. And if you don't know the Tedagatha, it's, it's a beautiful collection of poems that were uh, said to be recited by the Arahants, by the disciples of the Buddha during his lifetime, that put these words together, that often share a lot of the same teachings that, that he shared and the, the revelations that they had and the things that they discovered from their own meditation. And one such passage also talks about that mother and child relationship where kusala is the term that's used. And with that one, as a mother would want to be good or would be good to her only child, one should be good to everyone everywhere. And so as we see metta is this quality that we foster within ourselves, a desire for our true happiness and the happiness of others, we see then that skillfulness in terms of how we go into the world and provide our actions, do things in the world, act in the world. That is also something that we don't just do for ourselves, but also for the benefit of others. And tied to this also is the idea of being observant, of being mindful, of watching, of, of being discerning. And so with these three qualities, we see that we have this, this feeling of goodwill, this desire for our own happiness and the happiness of others, the long-term welfare and happiness for ourselves and others. And then in skillfulness, we see the means to do that, the actions that need to be taken in, in speech, in body and mind. And then this discerning quality, this uh, ability to be observant ends up being the, the way we can step back and look and, and see it all being consummate in vision. This language also shows up in precisely another sutta that is absolutely about snakes. In the Pali Canon, there are other passages where the Buddha provides the same type of lessons with regard to other beings. And there's one such example, and this one is in the Anguttara Nikaya, where someone ends up being bitten by a snake. So this particular sutta goes by a couple different names. One is the uh, uh, Ahina Sutta, which would mean like by a snake. And the other one is, uh, I think, uh, Ahiraja Sutta, which is like the, the, the snake king sutta. And in this sutta, the, the Buddha is, is in Sabathi, Jetha's Grove, Ananda Bindika's monastery. And 
these monks approach him. And these monks tell him, blessed one, ah, it's, we have sad news that a, a certain monk has died after being bitten by a snake. And the Buddha sits back and, and he says, well, then it's certain monks that this monk didn't suffuse the four royal snake lineages with a mind of goodwill. For if he had suffused the four royal, royal snake lineages with a mind of goodwill, he would not have died from having been bitten by a snake. Which four? And he goes on. And then he teaches the monks this particular type of goodwill, this recitation to think on. I have goodwill for the Virupakas. I have goodwill for the Erapattas. I have goodwill for the Chabyaputtas. Goodwill for the dark Gotamakas. I have goodwill for footless beings. Goodwill for two-footed beings. Goodwill for four-footed beings. Goodwill for many-footed beings. May footless beings do me no harm. May two-footed beings do me no harm. May four-footed beings do me no harm. May many-footed beings do me no harm. May all creatures, all breathing beings, all beings, each and every one, meet with good fortune. May none of them come to any evil. Limitless is the Buddha. Limitless is the Dhamma. Limitless the Sangha. There is a limit to creeping things. Snakes, scorpions, centipedes, spiders, lizards, and rats. I have made this safeguard. I have made this protection. May the beings depart. I pay homage to the Blessed One, homage to the seven rightly self-awakened ones. And so what I find beautiful about this quality of, of metta, even in this passage, the Buddha is responding to a monk having uh, died from being bitten. And his response is to share with his monks, well, here's, here's a way we can, we can send goodwill specifically to snakes. And then from there moves on to not just snakes, but every being everywhere to all beings. And then with all of that sense of goodwill, with all this sense of kindness and goodness and a desire for all beings to be happy, even these beings, any beings that breathe, what does he say? May the beings depart. So I read that and I contemplate that and I don't feel so bad about not necessarily wanting to be around snakes. That I can have this sense of goodwill for snakes this real sense for, of, of kindness and generosity towards them, a sense of, of wanting their happiness, their long life of, of good living, and not necessarily be a part of that. In fact, in the Thai forest tradition, it's often the case that this will be recited when uh, a monk or anyone residing in the monastery uh, finds a snake inside their, their living quarters. And they'll recite this with the hopes that the snake will then leave, and sometimes it works. This is important to keep in mind uh, for me and maybe for you as well, that when we think of, of metta, we, we tend to think that it's this kind of, of lovey-dovey quality, that, that you're just going to be gaga about everybody and then and everything, and then so then you're going to want them around all the time, which is, you know, the way we, we tend to view love is this kind of clinging quality or this type of quality where things got to be real close to each other. And as we work on something like metta, that means that we try to have it for all beings, which means not just the creepy crawlies like snakes and scorpions and centipedes and spiders and so on, but even much bigger things, you know, like a shark or an alligator. And I can cultivate all the metta I want for alligators. And it doesn't necessarily mean that I want one strutting right through my living room. But this means it's also the case when we apply this to the human realm, when we think about other people. And it's probably in that aspect that it'll matter more how we think on uh, not just kindness and, and goodwill and this quality of metta, but especially, I would say, in these other qualities of kusala in terms of, of applying um, our, our skillful actions, our, our words and bodily acts but then also our discerning quality, our, our wisdom, our, our banya. And that ends up being a lot trickier because we can say, may the beings depart and hopefully the snake leaves. And when we're out in the wild in nature, like I was, we can see the, the snake and then go away. 
but sometimes life ends up being a little trickier. How do you apply these same qualities, let's say, uh, at work or at home or in public spaces, you know, at a bus stop or a restaurant, you know? What do we do uh, with the snakes in, in uh, human clothing, let's say? And the thing is, it's, it's not uh, different in terms of the in in internal qualities, which is why when we talk about being observant, when we talk about being discerning, we're really talking about the inner qualities of turning the eyes inward in terms of observation. Recently, I was uh, reminded of those kinds of movies and TV shows like, you know, Jack Reacher and Jason Bourne and, you know, even other guys that aren't necessarily as violent like Sherlock Holmes. And we see these people having this amazing uh, situational awareness, this ability to look around and they picture everything and create full stories for why things happen. They can look at a guy and know which school they went to and when they you know, stop smoking and all this other stuff. And they can tell when, what's, what someone ate for dinner and all, all based, all based off of the stuff that they, they see when they look someone over and like, wow, situational awareness, the ability to uh, deduct and, and reason and so on. And for those of us who are, who are practicing as, as Buddhists, for those of us who are developing these qualities, who want to ensure that we, we are doing things, uh, with kindness and doing things in a skillful way, which means also a good or virtuous way. That's the other way we can translate uh, kusala, not just as, as skillful, but also as virtuous or good. We wanna be able to, to see that that's taking place, to know that that's taking place. To be consummate in vision means that we have to be able to look inside and see the inner landscape or inner terrain that we have inside. If situa situational awareness is what gets someone like Jason Bourne out of a tough spot in one of those action movies, then the internal tough spots, our own resistance, our own greed, our own hatred, our own delusions, and so on, with all the, these effluents and defilements, with that kind of internal battle, it also requires a situational awareness, that ability to, to look and see what's happening, which is tough, but not impossible. And one of the things that we see when we observe is that a lot of these qualities that we want to develop are qualities that exist in some capacity inside us. What we're trying to do is build up those internal muscles to continue on with this idea. We want to build these muscles so that we have more consistency in it. My response to that rattlesnake I saw on the trail of my friend uh, came from a good place. I would say that when we approached that rattlesnake and saw that it was a young rattlesnake, but it also could have been an older one, could have been a bigger one, a more intimidating one, I don't think we would have responded all that differently. We still would have been smart about it, kept our distance, been respectful, but been kind, recognized that, hey, it's not traipsing through our living room, we're traipsing through its, its living room. I can see in, in there that kind of kindness and that kind of skillfulness and that kind of discernment and, and being observant there. I can see all of those things. And that doesn't make me better than the other people who I saw pelting that snake with, with rocks. I think that when I, when I look back at what they were trying to do, I think that they wanted to be safe, that they felt intimidated. They felt scared they felt maybe repulsed and they were doing something that they thought was for their own good and as we came down the trail my friend and i i think that they too thought that that was something they were doing for us and our good we're chasing off the snake so you don't have to worry about it but the snake really wasn't bothering anybody as far as i could tell now i don't know maybe maybe by the time my friend and i had started walking back down that trail the snake had started moving and maybe was now more situated on the trail and not off to the side. I don't know. But I do think that even then, if, if the situation had been different and the snake had been directly on the trail, I think my friend and I might have just turned and said, okay, time to go walk down a different trail. We wouldn't have tried to step over the snake. That might have set the snake off. 
and trying in any way to push or pull or move or coerce the snake, same difference. But I don't think those people actually meant harm, but they still did harm because they weren't thinking about the snake. They weren't being observant enough to see that what they were doing might be in their interest, but not in the interest of the snake. And that matters as, as we think about what it means to be skillful, what it means to be good, kusala, what it means to be virtuous, is that we have to have the, the, the goodness there, the goodwill there, the kindness there, but we also have to have the wisdom there. And when we have those two, that helps us be more skillful. So again, looking at these themes as, as interrelated, we can see how we have this wholesome desire. We have the means to make that desire active, to make it a reality, to realize that desire. And then we also have to have the, the wisdom, the discernment, the observation skills to put all the pieces together into a complete and wholesome path for ourselves. So the, the self that I had back then, the one that was able to do that in the trail, wasn't always able to do that all the time. In fact, I can tell you, young 20-something me probably didn't do that even, I don't know, uh, half the time. I was kind of a, a reckless kid trying to find uh, love and acceptance in silly ways. Um, I've had to grow into my integrity the way a lot of us do. And that's the path anyway, that it's not that Buddhism as a path has a monopoly on kindness or a monopoly on, on skillfulness or even a monopoly on, on uh, discernment, but it's the way we seek to cultivate these qualities, the way we seek to improve upon them and have them shape our, our lives and to be the, the cornerstones, the hallmarks of, of how we, we go about life. It's how we put them into practice and to what practice, to what end. The, the freedom that we want to find in liberation and unbinding. So we take these somewhat mundane qualities that all of us possess to greater or lesser extent and build them up, make them strong, make them dependable, make them something that we can do all the time. Because I don't want to just be kind to that snake that one time, that rattlesnake that one time, but to all beings everywhere, the entire cosmos, including myself. I want to make sure that the things I do are not just skillful for others, but skillful for me. Kind not to others, but kind to me. And with wisdom that sees that through for myself and others, that ends up being the path. So I say all of this, keeping in mind that earlier this month, uh, a man named uh, William Martin uh, passed away at the age of 80, having been bitten by a rattlesnake. Now, the thing about William Martin was that he was actually a highly respected uh, herp herpetologist. He, he, his whole life was snakes. He had spent the better part of 80 years when he was about the age of 10 studying snakes and then had several run-ins with snakes throughout his life. A lot of close calls, either almost bitten or actually bitten. And at the age of 80, after all these years of being an advocate for snakes, in fact, even being considered uh, the ambassador for rattlesnakes, ended up being bitten in his own home and lab uh, at the age of 80. By, by a rattlesnake, the, you know. And of course, you know, it would be quite callous to say, oh, well, I mean, all he needed to know was this one special chant. You know, he, he didn't give any respect to the, the four snake kings and everything. Uh, you know, it'd be silly to, to say that. I think instead that he clearly showed a lot of the qualities I, I spoke of today, you know, as someone who had a lot of goodwill for snakes, for rattlesnakes, someone who had a lot of skill in how to, how to be around them and how to respect them and their space, how to observe them. And of course, that ability to be discerning, to know how to be around them and how to, how to conduct himself in those situations. And so he had almost 80 years of, of success until he didn't. 
And I think he probably wouldn't have made it into, uh, up to the age of 80 without all, all of those qualities. And if he was able to do that, well, wow. Uh, imagine what, what we might do if we became consummate in these qualities, perfected these qualities, perfected our metta, perfected our karuna, perfected our panya. What might we be able to do in 80 years, you know, throughout the course of 80 years? So uh, that's my, my food for thought for us today, to think on uh, kindness, to think on, on virtuousness, goodness, and to think on discernment, observation, wisdom. Uh, thank you for listening. If you have any question, you can answer right now. Stephen, thank you very much for that talk. Um, my family is having considerable issues with, I guess, uh, someone, <clears throat> uh, my son's partner or ex-partner in you, the, the Meta, and I've been trying to do that. But um, I'm just surprised. I, I'll tell you, in the last year plus, I thought that our family was doing some very good things and loving kindness and to a, a lot of, you know, different things. We moved and we helped a homeless woman and uh, and there's so much chaos in our life right now. And um, it's really concerning. And I sometimes go, what, gee, I guess I'm, I'm not doing everything I can is, uh, you know, in, the, in my Buddhist practice, but I, I thought we were doing a lot of good things. And, and I, in fact, was going like, boy, this is good karma, you know, and our, my wife is doing really helping this woman. We helped her for a year. It helped her survive the winter outdoors. And now she's in, a, she got it placed in a hospital to treat her, but a lot of chaos. And I, I am, I do think I'm, doing a good job of loving uh, kindness or metta, you know, and, but it's very challenging. And I, I do question why there's a cascade of events uh, happening. And our son has got a lot of challenges and we're trying to be very helpful to him. That's consuming a lot of our energy and time. And at some point you, you know, you, I, we just not sure how, how to handle it, but we continue to, to be helpful and supportive and provide support. But anyway, just saying that goes beyond the scope of your conversation, but I, I will say I once encountered a rattlesnake who was not coiled and he was across a trail well that I was running on and I stopped about 10 feet away and gently rolled pebbles uh, and that snake didn't move out of the way. But uh, anyway, that's my, I, I don't almost want to talk with you offline if possible, but um, I don't know if you'd be available for that. Anyway, We'll, we'll try to find the time, Dan. Uh, th okay. Thank you so much. I, I will say um, what you just said is, is very important for us to keep in mind in regard to practicing qualities like, like metta. Uh, we don't practice them because they make life more fair. Right. You know, right. the, the Buddha never said that that would be the outcome, that um, a lot of the time the, the protection that's provided ends up being internal protection. And what that means is that when outside circumstances get especially harsh, that method that we've been giving others, we turn inward and start giving to ourselves. And with everything else that ends up becoming stressful and hurtful and overwhelming, that's when we apply other qualities like uh, upeka, um, equanimity, uh, which we might think of as patience, that recognizing that things being impermanent and inconstant uh, means that they don't stay that way. And so uh, when I've been in situations where, where life seems particularly unfair, um, I've had to be kind to myself and and be patient about everything else and hope that it'll change and recognize that even if things seem rough the seeds i'm planting right now might come to fruition at any time so with with qualities like metta we're we're planting seeds and we don't get to choose when when they when they sprout and when they grow and when they fruit 
but the more good we spread around, the more good we have at our disposal, whenever that time may be. No guarantee, no fairness. That's why it's and, samsara. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and I, I wasn't saying we were doing these things because we thought they would result in a good, but I was yeah. just musing over uh, the fact, you know, earlier on that they are a good and we, you know, but uh, anyway, it's, there's, there's irony in our situation, I would say. No, I, I feel not. that. Mm-hmm. We'll, we'll, we'll try to talk soon, Dan. Okay. Uh, I, I think, did Selvin have a question? I was oh, you're, you're, that. you're still muted, Selvin. Does anybody have any question? Yes. I'm okay. sorry. Thank you, Stephen, again, for the uh, talk. Um, as you were talking about meta and the intent of it, I thought of the, the at least for me, the, the other, what came up for me was how practicing meta um, frees me from my own anger towards that other person or the fear towards the snake, snake the animosity towards somebody or the jealousy towards somebody. So in a way, I, I may not necessarily be making that person's life better <laughs> or the snake's life better, but I'm making my life better by letting go of the fear of the snake. Um, and the other thing was how um, in having that clarity, not operating from a place of fear or jealousy, I actually may learn more about that other person. And what I see as differences, they disappear and then it sort of might bring me closer to the snake. Not that I will be handling snakes anytime soon, but uh, that's what I thought. And I thought that was, um, that's what you talked about, elucidated in me. So I appreciate, I appreciate it. Um, one last comment. I like what you said about equanimity, seeing it as patience. Um, Cause it is, it, I, I think that's very helpful for me. So. Uh, just wanted to uh, express that and thank you. I appreciate that, Sullivan. You know, um, you, for me, you you really bring up a, a helpful reminder that, you know, we're we're talking about how useful, um, say, wisdom or or observation or this ability to discern with with appropriate vision as helping with kindness and helping with with skillfulness, but also at the same time, you know, uh, feelings like jealousy and anger and fear often have, have an ability to cloud our discernment, cloud our inner wisdom. And so sometimes it's helpful to work on those things first, because then it helps sort of, uh, clear, clear the, the air, the fog rolls away and sort of like cleaning dirty glasses in my case, like I have to do later. So it, for me, it shows all the ways that these path factors that we put into play are all reliant on, on each other. Um, that ends up being the important way to think about uh, interconnectedness. You know, We often think about interconnectedness as, as the way all life forms, inter, like this interbeing that we have. But um, sometimes it's helpful to just look within ourselves, this body and mind that we have, and see that the path factors we're working on are all symbiotic. They all depend on each other, rely on each other. And so that's that's something that uh, what you said reminded me about. So I thought it was worth sharing with everyone else as well. The sort of interdependentness we have even amongst these three qualities I was talking about today. So thank you for that. Uh, thank you, Stephen. And thank you, Selene. Make sure to come coming Sunday, okay? Yes, I'll be there. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you, Stephen. It's a nice talk. Uh, I like to more continue that talk, but mm, we don't have time because I just want to say a few things. Uh, metta, the one one of the sutra is called Metta Sanse, the result of the Maitri, result of the loving kindness. The Buddha gave that sutra and it say. You don't have to worry about the snake when you're practicing meditation, especially loving kindness meditation. When you're practicing loving kindness meditation, you are protect from a snake, from a fire, from accidents, so many things. There are ten or twelve uh, things. So read the Mittani Sansa Sutra, which is Mittani. 
Mithani Sans Sutra, uh, which is a result of the uh, myth. So again, I want to say thanks for everybody and hope to see you next week, everybody here. Uh, right now, we're going to chant the page, page four and page, page 10. Namo Tassi Bhagavatu Arahatu Samma Sambhutyasi Namo Tassi Bhagavatu Arahatu Samma Sambhutyasi Namo Tassi Bhagavatu Arahatu Sama Sambhutasa Bhutam Saranam Gachami Dhamam Saranam Gachami Sangham Saranam Gachami Sintiens Pinsa Numberless I vow to save them all. Deluding passions are unexhaustible. I vow to end them all. Dharma gates are limitless. I vow to study them all. Buddha's way is supreme. I vow to attain it. May suffering one be suffering free, and the fierce struggle fierce be. May the grieving shadow grief, and the sick fire help me leave. <laughs> see you next week next sunday uh please come and join again i have to say uh, by the power of the buddha dhamma and the sangha you all be well and be well and happy thank you sadhu sadhu sadhu